Oh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. And um, thank you so much for joining us uh, here tonight for our event with Headland Center for the Arts, featuring Aria Banyas, Vincent Chu, Tomas Moniz, Shelley Wong, and Hazel White. My name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and a mainstay of the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco since 1976. Without further ado, I'm very happy to turn it over to Emily and um, want to thank you all again so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Evan, and um, thank you for putting this together, for being so thoughtful and um, having access to all of our wonderful writers' books. Um, I am really grateful for this evening and to be able to pull these writers together, uh, these amazing writers of the Affiliate Artist Program at the Headland Center for the Arts. I'm going to um, introduce the Headlands a bit and then introduce our first reader and um, get this amazing evening started. Um, the Headland Center for the Arts is a multidisciplinary and international arts center dedicated to supporting artists, the creative process, and the development of new and innovative ideas and artwork. Um, in normal times, the Headlands uh, supports artists local and afar through their affiliate, um, the, sorry, their artist in residence program as well as the affiliate program. And they um, offer these artists studio space. Uh, they hold open houses three times a year and invite the public in. And it's really congenial and wonderful. Um, of course, this year has been different. And um, it's put our events online, of which there are very many um, wonderful Headlands events that most are recorded um, and available on the website if you want to catch up on past ones. Um, and there's, a, I think, only one event left for this year is tomorrow. Um, it is a artist talk with uh, the Tornasol awardee Troy Chu at 6 p.m. tomorrow, and you can find that link on the Headlands website. Um, this has also been, this has been a different year for the Headlands, and it's sped up some changes that the Headlands um, has been planning for a long time. And tonight you will hear work um, by five writers in the Affiliate Artist Program, as I've said, um, which I was also a part of a few, for a few years and um, benefited from deeply. The Affiliate Artist Program has been um, put out to pasture, however, as um, followers of the Headlands might have received their uh, information about. And this group of writers is the final group. Um, but for a final group, they are really ending the program in style. This is an incredible um, group of writers, uh, accomplished and talented and doing really interesting and important work. So um, I'm really pleased to be able to showcase them tonight. Um, what else do I want to say? The Headlands will continue to do their good work. It'll continue to change. Um, I feel lucky to have been part of uh, the affiliate program when it was up in 960 and um, it was really special times. So I'm grateful to be here, grateful for tonight. And I'm going to introduce, um, without further ado, uh, Ari Banias as our first reader. Ari Banias is a poet and the author of the poetry collection Anybody, which was a finalist for the Cave Tuts. Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the Penn Center USA Literary Award. His forthcoming collection, Asymmetry, will be out next year. He also had a chapbook by the same name um, from the Song Cave, which is a pretty cool publisher, back in 2018. Um, his recent poems appear or are forthcoming in Beast, Hyperallergic, Kenyan Review, The Nation, and The New Republic. And Ari lives in Oakland. Give it to you. Thanks so much, Emily, um, for that. And thank you for organizing. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, and thank you also to Booksmith and Evan for hosting this. Um, yeah, it's a real honor to be here um, and to read alongside Shelley, Vincent, Hazel, and Tomas tonight. Um, and I'm just going to jump in and um, read from that book that Emily mentioned, um, which should be out in about a year. Um, and I don't do lots of bantering between poems, so I'll just um, tell you a few things you might need to know along the way, but mostly I'll just be reading. Um, the first uh, poem is um, called Practice. I try to hold in my mind a chemical fire in Texas, a chemical explosion in Yangcheng, a passage by rubber boat from Kusadasi to Vathi, without even the before or the after, as though discreet as I can hold the mad king going madder, the spotless meeting room, a team of lawyers, the hemorrhoids of a team of lawyers, the soothing creams, each purchased individually, or the parched fields I have in my view, 
a pink bucket on its side in the garden all winter, a barely contained moment of ecstasy on a golf course stomping hard with my boots on spongy treated earth. Julie fucking Andrews. I shout into the high winds toward a brown scribble of unmanicured woods. Gales from the west southwest, the thousands of second homes standing empty, Swamps from which the spotted salamander emerge after thaw, after how many gallons of fuel in enormous steel tanks arrive at their destination intact. What can it possibly mean to remain intact, to oppose smug minimalism? What can the 22,000 metric tons of trash entering the ocean today in the bloodstream, in the paperwork, in the partially masked resentments in any work forced in the corn, in the soy, in the wheat, I try to hold in my mind as I hold in my mind a white van and an ATV, yellow as a 90s Sony Walkman, the chocolate milk stain birthmark on your right inner thigh, right next to your pussy like a witness, glossy ivy climbing the trees, having snared a single gray shopping bag, tattered spirit, bird again in the exhaust bed making its nest. My fingers in you and your face while I do that, mythic and ancient face of centuries, comedy, tragedy, microplastics buried imperceptibly in the face I can't completely hold, the face I love. Time lapse. The beauty of my home is that it moves, is how the thinking goes. 70 years ago, my grandfather trades a gold bracelet for an egg. A salt particle from the volcanic boulders dissolves, reconstitutes into terraces, footpaths, little heaps of goat turd. This year, fascists ascend the mountains to recruit again from the villages. A lamb will accept even the hardest rind of bread. Do I sing this? I confess I bought the beauty of my home is that it moves. I had my reasons. 40 years ago, adults dressed me as a cowgirl with a lisp. After they call the cave holy, people throw empty water bottles in it. When the lights go out, the cowgirl and I, freed from legibility, Stop trying to boil the sadness out of dandelion greens. One coral reef digests its closest neighbor, another coral reef. Um, this next poem is um, named, um, well, it's called Meander or Mandros, um, which is Greek. Um, and it's the name of a river in Turkey, the river Meander, which, um, as you can imagine, winds. <laughs> um, and it's also the name of the uh, what's known as a Greek key pattern. Um, so meander, meandros. Decorative Hellenic borders on deli coffee cups, on a civil on a silver ring I used to wear. It feels nationalist now. It was always nationalist. Actually, I would say dawn is fruity, not milky, not gold. What to do with the lie of ethnicity? At dinner, T says, Greece is an invention of the 19th century. Was this green once? Unknown. The cicadas go on. A law against refugees passed by the children of refugees. Pronoun study. Um, this poem is, um, well, I have my friend Helen Demos to thank for um, the line that spawned this poem um, about basically uh, the EU creating incentives for farmers um, in Greece to destroy their, um, their the, the crops on their land. Um, pronoun study. They paid them to cut their olive trees down. You paid them to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut their olive trees down. They paid you to cut your olive trees down. 
we paid you to cut our olive trees down. They paid you to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut our olive trees down. They paid us to cut their olive trees down. They paid us to cut your olive trees down. We paid you to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut your olive trees down. You paid them to cut our olive trees down. You paid us to cut our olive trees down. We paid you to cut your olive trees down. They paid us to cut our olive trees down. And um, I'm gonna end with this. Um, it's called Playa Vista. It's named for um, a neighborhood in Los Angeles. I even love the naps. Was thinking this as I walked through a marsh marked private property bordered by a six lane road with blocks of new construction, sandy orange, peachish beige condos right in the path of the sunset. Later I was thinking, I even like this long blonde strand of hair here beside the hotel pool caught on a rivet fixed to the plywood lounging platform painted black and faced in wood laminate so as to appear stylish. It's cheap. The wind blows a bit, then settles. The hair flails energetically, then almost vanishes. I count three separate hairs, each claimed by a different screw. A single cloud passes over the sun. From another vantage, the cloud would be elsewhere. Gnats and birdsong ecstatic in the reeds. The lit up LA fitness sign reflected in the marsh water, white on liquid pink. A duck paddles across and the letters smear. Last finds, facile nest faint less, it can be some other way, and is. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ari. That was really, really wonderful. Um, next up, we have uh, Shelley Wong, which I'm really looking forward to this reading as well. Um, Shelley is the author of A Very Anticipated, As She Appears, uh, coming out in 2022. Uh, it was the winner of the 2019 Pamet River Prize, and she also has a chapbook called Rare Birds from Diode Editions. She has received a Pushkar Prize and fellowships from McDowell, Kundiman, and, and the Vermont Studio Center. And um, I follow Shelley on Instagram, where she posts, sometimes posts, pictures of the headlands. And I always love seeing, um, in fact, you, you had the hallway of 960 recently. It was very beautiful. So um, with uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Emily, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, my fellow affiliates, and I really look forward to the day when we can all gather and celebrate each other in person. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Let's see, I'm gonna read uh, a couple Headlands poems and then um, some different pieces. This first poem is Inventory. At the last preserved Nike missile site in America, a deer walks between the barbed wire fences. A bell in the distance, a bird, a bell, a boat. Someday I'm that deer or the one bringing it water. Fog floats through the eucalyptus, its bark shedding like pages. The coast is the first line of defense. Overlooking the bay, a carpet of ice plant, tilting Monterey cypress, one toyon tree. When you go to the ocean, you tell the truth. During Fleet Week, the blue angels scrape against the sky. In the water, sea foam gathers in the shape of a whale. The ocean was the forgetting, a way out of the papers. In place of God, I hold other forms of devotion. A bell in the distance calling names, fireworks and paper, my best inventions. Headlands number eight. It was the year the deer came out to the road 
unbothered by locals. Cleared of fog, the evergreens are fading, perpetual. What is constancy along the West Coast? There are differing timelines as to when we pass the point of repair. Battery Alexander, Battery Wallace, Battery Mendel. Along the green roofs, I see travelers instead of soldiers. In the quartermaster building, I write poems in the attic. I do not desire to command myself. A hawk arcs over the decommissioned missile site where 19 year olds held the nuclear codes, surveilled the sky, chanted the numbers like a dial, an awful chorus. Draw the airplane for peace, strike the colors for annihilation. No doubt these days, all of the weapons are now housed in the pink shed. Berries emerge in the trees along the entrance to the tunnel. On the hillside, pompous grass strike the earth like arrows. At times, I sense I am perceived as out of the elements, an anomaly. In the widescreen aperture set in the hillside, I stand in the cement circle in place of the gun. Excuse me. Let's see. Uh, this next poem is fresh and part of a seasonal series I began in graduate school in 2013. So it's been quite a journey to lock this last one into place. Um, it's a series that explores visual narratives of women through seasons. Um, and using the lens of fashion to talk about femme identity, transformation, uh, desire, and in this one, protection. So this is called the winter forecast. This open interval, when nightgowns stalk the field, unraveling their light as an inoculation against loneliness, the models hold hands. In Chinese characters, two trees make a forest. In French, the ocean is masculine, the sea feminine. How does a rhyme determine our fate? Daughter, laughter, slaughter. There are two ways to survive, analog and digital. We can hear tree rings rendered as sound. Aboard the single swan boat, she cries, it's not the underworld. A bird possesses both a sound, both a song and a call. Silence can be a skin. For the encore, the girls dim their dresses and sleep, spun in silk, a finger to their lips, no trespassing on the runway. Women in black embroider orchids in the orchestra pit, await the next transformation, capes aside. Dialing a rotary phone, she needs an outside line. Um, also, I just want to take a moment and honor and send love out to all the affiliates um, for this last cohort um, and to honor their time and their work um, and all that's to come and um the entire lineage of affiliate artists um who've been part of the program over 20 years um your work has meant so much to the community and will continue to do so and um yeah i just really want to honor all of the people who have passed through building 960 in its final month um, relatedly, this poem is called Department of the Interior, um, based on the time I spent in another national park on Fire Island. 
The tide calls the water of the body. When a man invites me to a night out, I say, I have some work to do when I mean it's time to write this poem. On Fire Island, the sky ignites rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. A maze through the salt marsh bridges bay to ocean. Where I wander is protected federal land, not a branched interlude of neon pool parties. In the falling light, there is no one to look out for. Stumbling in the sand, I find only the crash of returning. I have come to this barrier island again to speak of a separation. Tomorrow, there will be three boats at various distances. One jet ski, lightning like a rumor of another realm. I tried to elucidate 11 years, but cannot be held to exactness. My mind floats out to water, and I am living through this world once. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, really wonderful work. And in your second Headlands poem, I loved hearing about the pink shed, which I thought about so many times. <laughs> um, and thank you for your words about the affiliate program. I, I'm, I'm very much more in its, um, its passing. Um, next up, uh, we have Vincent Chu. Um, Vincent is a barrier writer and author of the debut story collection, Like a Champion. His fiction has appeared in Still Magazine, Fjord's Review, Pithead Chapel, Pink Magazine, and elsewhere. He is a, um, he's an affiliate artist at the Headland Center and has been a Cambridge Center fellow and is a member of the Writer's Grotto, which I believe is facing its own pandemic changes. Um, but I'm so glad that uh, you're here, Vincent. I can't wait to hear, hear your work. It's always such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you, Evan, and um, thank you, fellow affiliates. It's great to see you. Um, it's an honor to join you guys tonight and, and to read with you. Um, so I thought I would read from what I'm working on at uh, The Headlands, which is uh, a novel that's in progress and has been so uh, for the past few years. I'm a bit of a slow writer. Um, and so I thought I would read an excerpt from that. And uh, the novel um, is fiction. It's a bit about travel and work and uh, technology. It's um, a bit of a comedy. And this excerpt is about, uh, uh, this chapter is about 40 pages into the novel. And just to give you some background, it'll uh, probably help uh, and make a little bit more sense. Um, uh, the character is a young man named Georgie, and he's decided to uh, quit his uh, day job, his office job, and, and travel the world for one year. And uh, on his way to the airport at the very start of his trip, he meets a very interesting uh, stranger who uh, convinces him to try meditation uh, for the first time. And so that's uh, this moment in the novel, uh, which is yet to be titled. Georgie and Mindy sat across from each other on the grass. Their bags formed a teepee between them. The soil was damp, but not enough to make your pants wet. Am I sitting correctly? Asked Georgie. There is no correct or Incorrect, said Mindy, but don't slouch so much and straighten your neck. Palms up. Okay, now close your eyes. Georgie did so. He immediately felt scared and vulnerable. He opened them. Mindy was still in front of him, eyelids down, hair static in the breeze. I said, close your eyes. Mindy took a deep breath. Meditation is about taming our monkey minds. The endless chatter, fear can never really go away, but we can quiet it. Shush. Five minutes, Georgie. Focus now only on your breathing. He closed his eyes again and inhaled. 
Feel the air past the tip of your nose, said Mindy. Notice your chest rise and fall. Hear my voice. Now, most importantly, keep your mind from wandering. Georgie breathed in and thought about Japan. He thought about how tasty his first meal in Tokyo would be, how fast the high-speed bullet train to Osaka would go. He thought about how nice the weather was going to be this time of year. It was soon spring, the cherry blossoms were just a month away. Be here and now, said Mindy. He thought about his colleagues at Oats Technologies, the suckers, sitting there in that stinky office, worrying about this meeting and that hard deadline and PowerPoint. What a miserable little creation that was. Sarah C and Moore were now following him on Instagram. Georgie hoped she would see his posts. Stay in the present, she said. Georgie wondered if he might get laid on this trip. It was going to be a year after all. It had been a while. There was that drunken, kind of awful one night stand from Love at First Swipe, Rose. She stopped texting him back. Now he was the one out of town. Georgie had since deleted his dating apps. Find your positive energy. Life had just become so depressing lately. Georgie was now simply doing something about it. It had begun to seem more each day that there was no real meaning to anything. No consequences, no end result. Life was just a series of arbitrary distractions, one after the other, after the other, after the other, until one morning you drop dead. Forget the outside world, said Mindy. Buying crap, saving for retirement, begging for a promotion, running some marathon, binge watching the latest BBC series. Surely there must be more, thought Georgie. Perhaps we were all meant to contribute something great to humankind. But Georgie was no artist or scientist or inventor. Was it love, family, creating babies, ensuring the same meaninglessness could be enjoyed by future generations? Listen to your body, said Mindy. What a jackass Georgie was. Here he was complaining about an office job when some people bled to put food on the table. Maybe life was indeed about helping others. Then again, what if the governments figured it out and suddenly everyone had T-bone steaks and a mid-century modern home and an electric car? Perhaps like other animals, the meaning of life for humans was only survival itself. After that, there was actually nothing. God never planned that far ahead. Yes, Georgie was born lower middle class and would likely die lower middle class if he was lucky. This trip would set him back. It was like making a pit stop during a race while everyone else still sped ahead, lapping your sorry ass. Maybe mom was right. If he became dirt poor after this trip, he'd see the world differently or lost his health, got sick. That was another way to gain a new perspective. Cancer, syphilis. A classmate of a friend in college got a sore throat one evening and then just croaked over his cornflakes. Best not to think about that kind of stuff. His body felt strong. Actually, his body felt stronger than ever. At this moment, it suddenly felt elevated and pure, like Georgie was somehow both weightless and powerful. There wasn't tension and frustration like most days, but a sense of true relief. And like that, things became calm. Georgie breathed in, out, nothing more, no less. He repeated, executing the action, noticing the sensation, 
forgetting all else. The air seemed real and full. It entered his nostrils, flowed down to his heels and then back up, exited his mouth, returning to the endless ocean of more air outside of him. He felt at ease, most excellent. Mindy didn't even have to say anything anymore. Georgie was meditating all on his own and he liked it. Time was moving differently even. Each breath seemed to last minutes, not seconds. In fact, it was as if more than five minutes had passed. Of course, that wasn't true. Mindy would have said something. Time was really a funny thing. It passed faster and faster lately. Would any year in the remainder of his life feel as long as a single summer as a child? Eventually, one day would be the last day of your life. How fast would that day seem? His mind was wandering again. Train. He had to catch his train. It had been more than five minutes. Definitely. Had in it? Georgie needed to look at his watch. He didn't care if Mindy got mad. She would understand. She was reasonable. Enough meditation already. It was time for this young man to go to the airport. Mindy, he called out into darkness. Georgie opened his eyes. He got to his feet, then slowly looked around. Mindy was gone. Mindy was gone, and so were his bags. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. That was great. Um, yeah, I really, especially of how time moves differently, it really resonated this year. Um, that was really great. Uh, next up, we have um, which I'm, I'm excited to hear Hazel read as well. Um, Hazel White is the author of the fantastic collection No Order Night Boat, which was a finalist uh, for the National Poetry Series, the Fence Autoline Prize, and California Book Award. She was one of the winners of a one minute monologue competition in uh, Tony Labatt's Public Art Project. At the moment. Her monologue was titled, I Want You to End Racism. She's writing now about violence. Welcome, Hazel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who joined. Um, thank you, uh, Booksmith, for hosting us and the Headlands Affiliate Artist Program. And I'm honored to read tonight with my fellow um, Headlands writers. So I'll be reading from a new manuscript, and the title is A Question. It's called, What's Not the Same as a Purchase? It's about violence. It's about um, patriarchy and often also about race, whiteness. It's investigating how systems of power dominate how incidents of violence are felt and told. Um, I'm writing about hermeneutical injustice, how experiences that are given no meaning or uh, inappropriately little meaning are resisted and not accepted into social discourse. And I'm writing also, I think, about ethical loneliness, um, a condition of not being able to properly tell an experience of violence because the listener has a limited capacity to hear it. So I'm going to read a few pieces from the first section um, where I'm hearing, not hearing, uh, military veterans um, who I met over the course of a year or two at a, an old military site at Headlands. And uh, this is the section also where I introduce one of the urgencies of my investigations. And that is that I'm the white mother of a young black son. So uh, I'll start right in at the first section. This view, uncomfortable, a verge. Marin Headlands Military Batteries, Northern California. The wall is four and a half feet thick. I meant to begin speaking of violence and I would write about these tunnels. A tunnel allows a silence to be broken. 
I venture these as entering caves, whispering. Instead, I retreat and borrow from Notes on the Underground, which begins the drive to modify the natural or given environment so that it will be safer is as old as humankind. I meet Derek, Cal graduate, former intelligence sergeant, US Army Special Forces on the side of the road. One of his group is carrying a pole with an American flag. I'm afraid of it, have arranged my anti-war values to be clean and orderly. But violence is present anyway. For company, I turn the car around, park, and approach a woman in the group. She directs me to him. By habit, my attention shuttles. As the view is coming and going with the fog, here it is, I am, and the air is warm, and now cold and gone, and here again, out across the water to the Golden Gate Bridge, an effort at attachment. Best of all, to see a boat out there, a secondary refuge, and to know already what here looks like from there. Vision, playing at patching together a security blanket. These headlands either side of the bridge formed a choke point, Derek tells me. Battery 129, where I stop each time I visit my writing studio at Headland Center for the Arts, was built to destroy humans, he says. But once you are in combat and you kill, or a friend is killed, nothing is any more black and white. It's demanding on a person to contemplate these things. I don't know why, but I can't talk or talk well enough about the magnitude of what we faced, he says. Deaf to the human meanings of this site, I photograph the light on rusted iron and stage nature texturally in relation to the gun pits flirting with volume and the scaled up vocabulary of war. Others do it using the site for fashion photo shoots. One day the tunnels and hilltop are converted into a set for Terminator Genesis where Arnold Schwarzenegger will save the United States from evil and the black paint is washed off the tunnels the next morning. Yet I am thinking of security all the time the survival of the endangered blue mission butterfly here, the dreams of the men who worked at the Nike missile site below my studio. One posted, I wish I could live in a nuclear missile silo. The only statement I feel comfortable making is I make cups, says Aaron Toole, Potter, an ex-Marine from the first Gulf War. Aaron listens to veterans' war experiences and makes a cup for each person that includes part of their story. Some of the cups, he hopes, can be starting points for conversations about unthinkable things. He has made and given away tens of thousands of cups. One cup was passed around. A woman like me said she could never drink from it. I am mapping muteness with fragments, not articulating the full catastrophe of, si catastrophe of silence, diffusion repeating distance, words gripped toward the world and the world goes spinning away, neutral, shouldering no injunction to listen. An internet search tells me Derek's a specialist in analyzing body language and speech patterns. I like him and ask him to decode mine. You're genuine, he says, or your speech suggests you are. The school children with their hoods up and sand shovels heading to Kirby Cove below Battery Spencer will know forever the weight and coldness of wet sand as somatic and cognitive experiences of measure inside and out agreeing. At the same time, the blue eyed grass in its spring consideration of emergence, a dynamic measuring of light happening in its leaf pigment interacting with what scientists are calling florigen a thing they don't know with two forms, one stable and the other converting into the other at night, it's probably not one thing, moves from the leaf to each flower bud to nudge it or it doesn't. Whereas violence spreads distortions between systems, the head becomes uncanny in the face of it. 
My caring is present and absent, a standoff against what I allow to touch or not touch my skin. I dominate what can reach me. I can disallow hearing to keep inside and outside separate and not stir the peripheral sensations. Making for a volatile consciousness, trains of action cut short, a confused text, and yet seemingly a necessary text to associate feeling with response by writing something on paper. The bare end of a year arrives suddenly, porter toilet doors banging in the wind, tunnels frigid, landscape raw with consequences, too late now that each rain counts, each instance of erosion. This is a space that is going backward into itself for a very strong confrontation. I am the white adoptive mother of a young black man. Mario Woods' mother said in a long, painful interview with a California magazine that she was giving the interview to explain that if we had known Mario, we would not have been afraid of him. After Michael Brown was murdered, alone in the tunnel, I yell, hands up. Joined with others across the country in a cry for justice, my rage breaks. I hate and I weep, I crave a strong muscular motion, I itch and itch, I rant, I kick at the world, I must articulate, I will insist. Urgency of action spreads in my hands, unscrambles location, pins the writing studio. I'll end there and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hazel. Um... I remember you uh, describing at least maybe even a year ago some aspects of this project and it's so wonderful to um, hear from it. It's really wonderful. I, I kind of can't believe we're on our last reader. I, I feel like we should all just go again so that I keep on hearing your work. But um, uh, here we are um, with a fantastic uh, finale with uh, Tomas Moniz. Um, his debut novel, Big Familia, was a finalist for the 2020 Penn Hemingway, the Lambda, and the Forward Indies Awards. He edited the popular Rad Dad and Rad Families anthologies, and he's the recipient of the SF Literary Arts Foundation 2016 Award, as well as being a Headlands affiliate, um, and a few other residencies. Uh, with the one that I'm most curious about is the um, Space on Rider Farm. I have been so curious about that residency. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, and he teaches creative writing at Berkeley City College, Ariel Gore's Literary Kitchen, and the Mendocino Coast Writers Conference. And this is my favorite part of um, the bio that Tomas sent me. He has stuff on the internet but loves pen pals. PO Box 3555, Berkeley, California 94703. He promises to write back. Let's all send him a postcard. Thank you, Tomas. Yeah, I would love that. That's been the best thing about writing a book was getting all the letters from people. Um, so I'm just, I'm, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to read with everyone here tonight. It was really wonderful. And I can't wait to see you all in person. I really want that experience. But um, so I'm gonna read from the project. I actually spent the first month at Headlands kind of wrapping up and sending off. And so um, I'm just gonna read the something from the beginning. Um, all you need to know is the main character is named Dolly Vargas and it's a story about uh, family legacy, making art and starting fires. So let me get going. Uh, beginning number three. My sister Tanya and I were raised by anarchist parents who wholeheartedly believed in revolution and thought the first battlefield was in how we created our families and communities. We grew up on a little acre of land our family called the Garden of Evil. Between Eugene and Medford, east of I-5, we lived in a converted Greyhound bus lovingly nicknamed Wheels, adorned on the sides with graffitied political messages that read, that seemed to change with every new social issue, arm the homeless, food not bombs, no blood for oil. Think what you will, but this was way before reclaimed buses and slipstream trailers became so popular, and believe me, you can have them. I'll happily take my cute late merit condo with dishwasher and no yard maintenance every time I have the choice. But I have to say, give my parents credit. It had to be hard to be a radical in the mid 80s, Reaganomics, Dayglo plastic products, preppies, yuppies. 
They met at Cal State Chico in a class taught for one semester by the legendary Cesar Chavez on labor organizing. Imagine that, labor organizing in the 80s, that should give you a sense of who they are. My mother, looking all viva la mujer, dark skin, black straight hair, sat with the machistas, a default Chicano security force protecting Mr. Chavez from the threats he received as news channels and newspapers chided the university for letting a dropout teach a class. The machistas clap their mecha clap, 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 and gets faster and faster. Every time Chavez said something about farm workers and education and social justice. So you can imagine they clapped a lot. My dad, pale skin and thick mustache, one of the few white students who enrolled, sat respectfully in the back. He had read enough 60s and 70s history to know that as a white male, he should not be in the spotlight. Not that he would have wanted the spotlight, mind you. He was more of a dreamer than a leader. My mother tell us how irresistible a sensitive, radical dude my father was. She'd tell us all her friends were pissed when she started dating this white boy. Her friends expected her to stick with them, but my mother was her own woman, she'd brag. My mother would get serious and tell us, and my, me and my sister, that as women, we could fuck who we wanted to fuck, and not just because we, and just because we fucked someone once doesn't mean they get to fuck us again unless we wanted to. My sister and I would give each other not an agreement and look at each other with that look that sisters can give that said without speaking that neither one of us knew what she was talking about, but that we'd discuss it later. Needless to say, my dad was cool with this arrangement. When he told the story of their beginnings, he wasn't sure if they were actually in a serious relationship until she asked for a key to his apartment six months after they met. He was so excited, he gave her his only copy and found himself locked out later that night. We frequented Umpqua Hop Springs, Hop Springs, a hippie hangout and radical rendezvous meeting place, though clearly posted signs said no camping nor nudity, which of course no one listened to. All the adults would talk excitedly about some tree sitting or new political issue or on a more practical front, cops raiding growers in the area or maybe a forest fire. They'd hang out for hours, drinking homebrew chilled in the river, smoking weed, offering to share with anyone who wanted it. During the day, Tanya and I would run around the riverbed and gather soap rocks. Uh, when you rubbed the rock on your skin, it suds up and created this mask-like coating on your body. My mother told us that indigenous people used to clean their skin and she'd lean into us and say quietly like she was sharing something secret and powerful that women would rub in spells. Now my mom rarely ever exaggerated or spoke longer than she needed to. So when our mother told us a story, unlike our father's stories, which usually we rolled our eyes at, we believed her. Sometimes my mother would let us soap up her face and body and she'd lie flat on the rocks with us. She had large breasts that hung low and she'd lift them up, hold them up and let us soap the pale skin hidden underneath. She'd laugh, yelling that it tickled, but that we, wouldn't, she, we couldn't stop, explaining that sometimes it was necessary to be uncomfortable. The best thing though, was when people would arrive and we'd offer to soap them up. We'd snicker at how uncomfortable some people were at the sight of us covered in drying green film, wanting to rub their body with rocks. As I write this, I can see why, of course. I remember one time our parents talking with other adults about a fire some activists started at a ski lodge construction site. While my sister sat silent, always lost in her own world, I kept in interrupting, asking way too many questions. Why were they burning buildings? Isn't that bad? Isn't that dangerous? We don't like the forest when they're on fire. My father said, dolly, dolly, dear. Actually, forest fires are healthy for the forest. You know that, you know this. Things need to burn regularly sometimes. I saw my mother smile, her see what you started smile at my dad, who continued to say, sometimes for things to change, it requires a little discomfort. I said, I would never start a fire. My mother looked back and said, our goal is that you don't ever have to. But I often dream of fire, 
of the beautiful way it consumes, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. Fire is the threat of forests ablaze. Fire made us more than once drive our bus quickly to Eugene, the sky brown, the air acrid, difficult to inhale. Fire was the only thing that could quiet my parents who were never quiet. Sometimes I dream how flames look welcoming, how, um, uh, how this is the way that the way the fire moves like fingers of an upturned hand or like tongues multiple and hungry. Fire is sex and desire, delicate and dangerous. Fire is the campfires we sat around surrounded by trees and nighttime skies and white stars. The way my parents sat and read together, the way my mother played guitar, never singing the lyrics, but humming along to All I Want by Joni Mitchell the way they looked at each other in such a non-parenting way and would leave my sister and me alone as they walked into the blackness surrounding us that the fire made even more intense. And we would sit, we sat shushing each other, trying to hear them. The low moans mixed with the crackle of fire. I felt wrong, but my sister and I smiled because we knew that our father, our mother, they loved each other. I like that. Let me start this confession with fire and desire. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Tomas. That was really wonderful. Um, uh, I can't believe we're at the end of our reading and um, I'm hoping that we will have some questions from our wonderful audience. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting to uh, maybe get some some of uh, some of the curiosity from our audience, something I've been thinking about um, a bunch, and I feel like when I heard Shelley's line, um, "I do not desire to command myself," it really resonated with me. And I think all the time about how this pandemic situation has kind of forced us into positions where we must command ourselves and where our um, our livelihoods and our uh, access to uh, our creative communities has been disrupted. Um, so I wondered if we could maybe um, think about and maybe discuss a little bit what like, I know we keep on collectively hoping that this lockdown will somehow come to some kind of end. Um, and I feel like it, it must in some way, but I wonder if we could kind of collectively conceptualize like what does the next year look for look like for a San Francisco Bay Area writer or artist um, with our uh, with the happy in some ways the lucky thing that we don't require space to exhibit our work the way a visual artist does but um, that there are other precarious elements to our craft and I wonder if anyone else has been thinking about these terms and thinking about what the next year looks for you. I can speak briefly to thinking about, um, you know, I know a lot of my friends have books coming out or events that were scheduled to happen. And so I've been really trying to imagine creative ways to support them, to continue to kind of reach out and connect with them. Because I think that's one of the things for me, at least, that I miss is the, the way in which we, you know, had such community in the Bay Area. And, and it's been inspiring to see how it's continued, like events like this, but, you know, thinking this coming year, how to begin to, to how that's going to evolve from where we are to not what we were, but, you know, something perhaps a strange amalgamation of both, maybe? I don't know. I'll stop there. Sorry, I meant to say that uh, it's not been a bad year for me to be studying violence and suffering. Um, Um, I would love, Hazel, to hear more about this idea of um, ethical loneliness that you mentioned in your um, description of your piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it relates to the current situation. Um, um, well, I think about the doctors and nurses, the experiences they're having. Um, and I don't know that we can feel them and or and I think of a, that as a sort of catastrophe of silences. Um, but I think there are probably all kinds. Um, there's uh, a, a far higher than usual um, rate of domestic violence, I hear. There's also more uh, violence in gun violence in neighborhoods. So it seems like there are a, 
sort of a crushing number of stories and experiences um, that are not being told. And I know the numbers are important, so the COVID numbers and so on, but I, I think about all the untold and, and the stories that will they be told? And will, will we be able to listen? And thinking about violence, you know, I thought of um, Ari, your poems that are connected to Greece. And I wondered if you might speak a bit more about your own connection and how those poems um, came to be. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, both my parents are Greek um, and were born and grew up there. Um, so I have like family. Um, relationship to it as a place. And um, my, my mom lives there um, now after many years of living in the US. So, you know, I, I haven't been able to be back, but um, like since the pandemic began, of course, but um, yeah, um, I don't know. It's a place that like I have a strong, like psychic kind of emotional relationship to despite ha never having like lived, lived there properly. Um, and so I think I'm just trying to think about the ways that, you know, Greece is, you know, considered the birthplace of Western civilization. And it's also this like, w which I, I say critically, um, if that's not obvious. <laughs> um, and then also just um, the ways it has been sort of cr crushed um, economically and just as a place where like, it's a microcosm of so many of the um, difficult and, um, and like painful sort of like structural violences that we see here in the U.S. as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I have to say about it right now. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I thought that was particularly poignant in the poem you read about pronouns that, you know, played with how those, um, how that cycle of, uh, the violence of the um, cutting down the olive tree, but then also how that experience and blame and um, uh, responsibility is like shared throughout. It was um, really masterful. Um, I don't think we're getting a lot of uh, questions from our wonderful audience. They've been so um, attentive this whole hour. I wonder if um, any of our writers have questions for each other or if we just want to um, I don't know, collectively sing our praises for the experience of being able to be in a program that brought everyone together. Well, I'll do that because of the way <laughs> Zoom works. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I just wanna say um, a huge thank you to our readers and to the booksmith and to Evan. Um, an enormous thank you to the opportunity to be um, part of this community that, uh, obviously is changing, but I hope never dissipates fully. I don't think it will. I don't think with the power of the arts community in the Bay Area, we'll see the end of it. Um, and I wanna thank our um, audience members for coming and supporting and all the wonderful comments and uh, compliments that have been going on in the chat. And um, I hope we all flood Tomas's uh, um, post office box with our uh, postcards. We've shared your address in the chat. And um, yes, and um, please not only buy our wonderful writers books, but buy them from the booksmith. Thank you, and, Emily. Oh, go, go on. No, Sorry. I know. Oh, I was just gonna uh, share my love for, for all of your readings tonight. Um, it, this is a great group, um, uh, well curated, Emily, and um, and uh, it's it's so nice to uh, to uh, to check in uh, uh, with you guys. Um, you know, I, I don't get to hear you all as often as I would like, and it's always a treat um, uh, when we cross paths again. So um, uh, keep up the good work, and um, and thank you for sharing it. Um, uh, for those of you who are tuned in, thank you so much. And thanks for sharing your love in the chat. Um, uh, get some books, treat your friends and loved ones uh, uh, to some books for the holidays. And um, maybe maybe make your enemies smarter. Send them your favorite books. I don't know. Um, but but buy some books from Booksmith. And um, have a good end to this, to this strange year um, if, if we don't see each other here um, before then. Uh,
um, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, writers. And um, thank you all tuned in at home. Have a good night.